introducing you a little bit to the way that I think about uh, writing criticism and very much I couch this within my own experience. You may feel that your perspective is totally different and when we end this session you may still feel that um, and that I think is, is perfectly legitimate. I think everyone is entitled to have very individual views about what criticism is. What is it for? Why would anybody want to do it? Um, again, I will issue this caveat. All of these opinions about arts criticism are very much my opinions only. Um, and I do not think that they are authoritarian or uh, they are not the authority in what arts criticism is. But I think the longer that you spend in arts criticism and the more that you look at how different people address this question, you will find that there is not consensus even within the most professional people in the industry, even with, with people who are writing for the New York Times, who are writing for the Guardian newspaper, who have been for decades, there is not necessarily consensus on this question. Sad to say, it doesn't work. I've never met an artist who told me, Oh yeah, I read this review and I really internalized what this review said about my work. And when I made my next exhibition or my next performance, I thought I've really got to address that. This critic is, you know, he's got the right idea. That's the direction I want to go. I'm going to take those, that feedback and I'm going to go in that direction. Just kind of doesn't happen. And there are many reasons for this, but first of all, you know, the artist is not your friend. And if you're giving them feedback in this public way and thinking about arts criticism as something that is public, that you're not necessarily doing for yourself. So while um, Shaza has mentioned that one of the things that arts criticism can do is to help you unpack your own views, it's not for you. Journaling is for you. Arts criticism is a public act. Is it really our place? Do we believe that this is what a critic needs to be? The person who knows everything. The person who passes on judgments from their elevated position on high. Or, you know, is the critic more a part of the conversation, a voice among other voices? Um, does the critic have certain, uh, a certain degree of insight, extra insight? On one hand, I would argue yes. A critic should certainly have much more knowledge about their subject than the average person who is reading their review. But often this is not the case. Um, and I think someone mentioned just now about how the rise of social media means that all of us can bring our own perspectives into the public eye much more easily. And that's certainly true. This has actually brought about kind of a crisis in arts criticism because now everybody really can be and is a critic, which is great in a way. There are two very different perspectives on this question of, you know, do we consider the critic to be an authoritarian dictator? Here are two responses, um, both from extremely established authorities. So here's Dwight Garner from the New York Times. And his opinion is that, yes, what we need is excellent, authoritative and punishing critics. Perceptive enough to single out the voices that matter for legitimate praise, abusive enough to remind us that not everybody gets or deserves a gold star. So this is very much that kind of old school idea of a critic being the one who hands down the punishments um, from on high, the critic who is really the authority um, and who you know gets to make decisions, yes, you're right, no, you're wrong. Here's Richard Brody from The New Yorker, similar kinds of um, qualifications as Dwight Garner, uh, who has a very different perspective. In his opinion, Criticism is a damned and doomed activity because critics have or should have a sick feeling of bad faith every time they lift the pen or strike the keyboard. Criticism is a parasitical operation that depends not only on the activity of others, but also on the greater activity of others. I 
think lots of critics start to think that, oh, you know, my criticism is as important as art. But the truth is, at the end of the day, if the art doesn't exist, the criticism cannot exist. Whether you have a sick feeling of bad faith or not, every time you lift the pen or strike the keyboard is very much up to you. I must say, I really do. When you sit down and you start to write a review, I often think like, oh, okay, who am I to have opinions about this? And who am I to think that these opinions are worth reading? Who am I to think that I have actually something to say that people should listen to? And that is exactly the sick feeling of bad faith that you should feel. Write the review in a day, um, a lot of my reviews are quite long, about 1,500 words. By the way, I don't recommend this because, you know, people don't read that much. 800 words is plenty, um, but it's actually more difficult to write an 800 word review than it is to write 1,500 words. Um, so this is really a skill that everybody needs to practice, including myself. But I write it, I leave it overnight, and I don't post it till the next day. And often overnight, I'm allowing things to settle and I come back to it the next day and I look at the tiny, tiny word choice and I think, you know, is that really what I want to say? Is that in 10 years time what I want to look back on and say, yeah, I claim those words and that opinion and I'm comfortable with saying that. Um, and sometimes I still feel terrible. You know, you press the you press the enter key and you pop, make it public and you still think, oh, I've made the wrong decision. But I think in some ways you have to. And this is what keeps you feeling um, honest, being honest with yourself. Of course, what we need in your review is some information, and this is the boring stuff, again, including the title, the genre, the general structure of the event, the names of the main artists, the venue, I think, because actually the venue says a great deal about what kind of work it is. And if there's a story or even if there isn't one, a brief synopsis or a brief overview. And all of this information needs to exist within the first few paragraphs, not as a list. Although this, again, depends very much on where you're, um, uh, where you're publishing this material. So some of your publications may just require this information to be listed at the top before you start your review proper. In my opinion, that's kind of a cop out, but it's a hell of a lot easier because you think, ah, oh, yeah, information, whatever, boring. Uh, you know, you just need to look at the program lab. That is true, but the trick is how do you present this information in a really interesting way, which doesn't sound like you're just like, this show happened at blah, blah. This show is a blah, blah. This show was done by blah, blah, and blah, blah. That's journalistic writing skill right there and let me say sometimes the first couple of paragraphs and really trying to insert this information in the most unobtrusive way crafting your narrative around it is the most difficult thing to do and again all of these unless you really want to talk about it if the show happens at three o'clock in the morning yeah, you really kind of want to talk about that. That might, might be something you want to address. Um, the length of the show. If it's a normal length, don't worry about it. If it's five hours long and it's durational piece and the audience can come in and leave and, you know, and it's at three o'clock in the morning, you need to talk about the length of the show. The number of people in the audience, whether it was sold out, the responses that they had. Again, not really necessary. Minor artists, sponsors and funders. It is the artist's obligation to make sure that their sponsors and funders are prominently displayed in all of their uh, propaganda. It is not the critic's obligation to kowtow to that. This is a thing that a lot of people kind of don't highlight, I think, when thinking about uh, criticism. In dance criticism especially, it's really very necessary. In other kinds of arts criticism, it may be less necessary. If you're the kind of critic who can include, you're talking about, say, um, visual art, and maybe you just want to hone in on one particular artwork, and you have the capacity to print a full color, beautiful picture, photograph of your artwork, or, you know, a video, 
Uh, you may not need to provide this kind of description, or the description is certainly provided in the video itself. Yeah, so definitely description starts to build your story. And you remember, of course, that in journalism, building a story, and especially a human story, is you know, one of the main ways in which you can keep people reading because they want to find out what happens at the end of the story. Um, so painting a picture for the audience. Yeah, because we've got to remember that, of course, most of the people who read this are not going to be people who've seen this work. So they need to get an impression from you of what the work actually is before they can even start thinking about what they might feel about that work. Um, to give a better sense of what happens, so... Aina, big idea. What does that mean, big idea? Can you expand more? So pull in potential audience, same as um, previous quote to hook the audience. Yep, to attract readers, to attract the audience. Um, grabbing the reader's attention. Yeah, but remember, you're not just doing this in the beginning. You do description is something that you, you do throughout um, the entire review. So evoking emotions, here we go. Okay, evoke emotions. That's kind of a nice idea that you can use description to do that. Um, to And to highlight what the artist means to convey. To highlight or maybe to suggest. Let me just make that editorial change. Uh, yeah, to show what the critic saw. Thanks, Morgan. To show what the critic noticed or observed. You need to be building trustworthiness in your review. Every reader is naturally skeptical. And in this day and age, doubly so. We are taught to be skeptical of everything that we believe. There's so much fake news out there. There are so many people trying to lead you astray. So when it, so a reader starts reading your criticism, they think, oh, who are you? Why should I listen to you? So as you are writing, you need to be with every single sentence persuading the reader that, you know, if you don't want to persuade them that you're an utmost authority, maybe that you don't feel like that's your role, but you do want to be persuading them that you are a trustworthy narrator. You're not an unreliable narrator, you're a reliable narrator. And you do this by building in facts, by feeding facts that the reader starts to be can believe are true, that don't strike the reader as, oh, I don't believe that that's not what they did. But most people kind of think that the heart of your review is the analysis and interpretation. I certainly do. Um, and this is where you really bring your inner self in to be part of the conversation, because this is your view. It's your analysis. It's how you interpret it. It's how you make meaning of it. What interpretation can do. So this is from Cynthia Freeland's a useful little book called Art Theory, a very short introduction. Um, and she says, I would describe interpretation as explanations of how a work functions. How a work functions to communicate thoughts, emotions, ideas, and a good interpretation must be grounded in reasons and evidence. And those reasons and evidence you may already have been giving in your description and should provide a rich, complex, and illuminating way to comprehend a work of art. Sometimes an interpretation can even transform experience of art from repugnance to appreciation and understanding. And this is really what you're going for. What you're looking for is that moment that you give the reader this really, not just sparking their curiosity, but sparking an extra level of understanding, sparking an aha moment, a an, an idea, realization of, oh, I didn't, didn't know that art could do that. Critics are not gonna remember everything. Even if you are sitting there with a pencil writing in the dark, you can't write down everything and you shouldn't be. You should be only, you should be selectively observing, which is, you know, a skill in itself. Um, but there are some critics out there like Deborah Jowett who feel like, you know what? Not for me to say, is this a great work? This is what I remember. This is what I noticed. This is what how I saw it connected to this work and this work. This is how it made meaning for me. Don't know how it's gonna work for you. 
kind of up to you. I'm not going to tell you four stars out of five. No. You want to figure out how many stars out of five you're going to give it? You go see the show. A question that a lot of people ask, and it's in lots of descriptions of like criticism for university students, teach the students to be unbiased in their criticism, which I always feel like, this is not my job. Why? Because I don't necessarily think the critic should be unbiased. Um, I'm not going to build the the argument for why a critic should be unbiased. I think you probably all know why we should not be biased. But I'll give you Joan Acacella, who is again my favorite dance critic. Um, and this is her opinion. Her opinion. No one who is over a day old wakes up in the morning without some biases. It is childish to ask that a critic be without biases. Taste, some sense of judgment about the field, is a large part of what a magazine or a newspaper is buying when hiring a critic. They are buying your biases. They pay you for your biases. Two options. Yes, you can do that and say straight off the bat, so-and-so, who is my best friend, has curated this wonderful exhibition, (laughs) this amazing exhibition, this, you know, groundbreaking exhibition. Um, And your reader can then take that on board. Readers are not idiots. Don't condescend to them. Again, they are skeptical. Again, we all know about, you know, not trusting the, what you're reading and, and really trying to unpack the authority and the trustworthiness of what you're reading. So if you come off and tell them straight off the bat, the choreographer is their wife, the reader can take that on board and they will read everything else within within that perspective. They know what the relationship between husbands and wives are. They know what kind of um, respect and, and extra love and affection is due to a wife from a husband. You don't have to tell them about that. They know that. So let them make up their own minds. What is a partisan critic? Basically someone who is incredibly biased, to put it really simply. Someone who has an idea of an artwork that they really love and they want to share this love with everybody else. And this could just be, you know, a genre thing. Oh, I think um, traditional Sarawakian dance is the best thing. I want to share my insight, my, my knowledge, my superior access with as many people as I can about traditional Sarawakian dance. I'm going to see every single show that has traditional Sarawakian dance in it. I'm going to write about it. Well, probably your readers would get a little bit bored after a while, but um, that is a partisan critic and it's also a place you can be. And it's not a place you need to be ashamed about. A lot of you uh, picked option three and you know what you think a role of a critic should be. You are, you're like a super fan. You're writing for other fans and you're writing for other would-be fans. You're trying to convince people that, you know, art is great. You should see this exhibition. You should go to this show. You should spend money on this. Um, And that makes you partisan. It makes you biased. And that can also be okay. 